Hey, Light Church, thanks so much for joining us today. Excited that you're here. We're actually kickstarting a brand new series called I Am. We're looking at the seven I Am statements found in John's gospel describing who Jesus is. Uh, but before we dive into some worship and the message, I want to let you know that if you need anything, finding out more information, if you want to let us know who you are, want to connect, if you'd like to give your tithe or offering, all of that can be done at lightsandiego.com. And just one special announcement. This Monday evening, if you're watching this before April 15th, uh, we'd love to invite you to a dinner that we're having in downtown San Diego at our building at Loose on Kettner. And we're going to be talking about the vision and the dreams we have for a building that we're going to be restoring in Bankers Hill. We'd love for you to join us at 6.30 p.m. Tickets are $100 a person. And all of the proceeds from the ticket sales and that we raise are going to go to helping create this beautiful, redemptive kingdom center right in the heart of our city. And we can't wait for you to join us. If you can't make it Monday night, but you'd like to give towards that building, you can do that as well on our giving page. Just click the downtown building uh, restoration tab. We'd love for you to join us for that. But let's get our hearts ready to worship the Lord and then we'll dive into our new series.
So we just finished a series on the Ten Commandments where we see Moses delivering these ten different rules, this framework for how Israel, coming out of slavery, can learn how to live as a free people in healthy relationship with God and with each other. Well, long before that happened, Moses had an interaction with God, a moment where he was called into this purpose and destiny for him to be a deliverer. And in this encounter at a burning bush in Exodus chapter 3, there is this interesting scenario that happens where a part of this exchange, God, for the first time in the Bible, reveals his personal name to Moses. This is where we're going to pick it up in Exodus 3 verse 10. When he's talking to Moses, he says, Therefore go, I'm sending you to Pharaoh so that you may lead my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses asked God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He answered, I will certainly be with you. And this will be a sign to you that I am the one who sent you. When you bring the people out of Egypt, you will all worship God at this mountain. Then Moses asked to God, If I go to the Israelites and I say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you. And they asked me, what is his name? What should I tell them? God replied to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. This is how I am to be remembered in every generation. This phrase, I am who I am, this personal name of God, has this mystery around it. Um, What does that mean? It it doesn't feel, at least how it's translated, doesn't really feel clear to us. So what what about this name uh, are we supposed to take away? The Dutch theologian Herman Bovnik says that God is independent, all sufficient in himself, and the only source of all existence and life. Yahweh is the name that describes this essence and identity most clearly. His name is being. One of my professors said it, that a better translation would be something as to the point of, I will be who I will be. And the actual Hebrew words that are being spoken, which then are translated into the YHWH Yahweh, is the, the verb Haya and Eya. Sigmund um, Moronoko writes that the Hebrew being verb Haya Eya is not the abstract Greek Enai to be, the mere existence per se. To the Hebrew, to be does not just mean to exist, but to be active, to express oneself in active being. It's also interesting to note that the pronunciation of I am or Yahweh is one of those words, one of the only words that you do not use your tongue for and you keep your mouth open for the entire time. So when you say Yahweh, one of the, uh, one of the ideas behind this is that the correct pronunciation actually might be an inhale and exhale. Yah way. And if that is the case, because we don't know the exact pronunciation, but if that is truly how it sounded to Moses, how interesting to think that the first word a baby would ever say as it comes out of the womb, or the last word that we would say as we're leaving earth is the name of God. It is the very breath that we breathe. There's something about this name that is powerful It's God's active being, that he is who he is. This name, which later on is is no longer translated by the Jewish people in fear of treating it with irreverence, begins to start having compound names. There's actually seven compound names in the Old Testament. For instance, Yahweh my healer, Yahweh my banner, Yahweh my provider, and so on. And these seven compound names in the Old Testament begin with the compound name Yahweh Yireh, often translated as Jireh, Yahweh Jireh or Jehovah Jireh. 
the Lord will provide. But a better translation might not be to provide. It's actually from the verb to see or to see to it. And so it's interesting that in the Old Testament, there's these seven compound names, meaning Yahweh is like this. And the very first one is that Yahweh will see to it. He will provide. It's used in Genesis chapter 22 when Yahweh provides a sacrifice while Isaac and Abraham are on the mountain. And the reason I'm bringing up is that this name I am, and specifically the instance I am will provide, is taken by John hundreds of years later when he writes his biography of Jesus' life. And the way that John frames his gospel is through seven signs and seven I am statements. And guess what the very first I am statement that John uses is? Is that I am the bread of life. I am the God who will provide at our most basic need level. He says this in John 6, 35, I am the bread of life. Jesus told them, no one who comes to me will ever be hungry and no one who believes in me will ever be thirsty again. I find it incredibly interesting and definitely not coincidental that the Old Testament and John's gospel begin our understanding and unpacking of God's name as someone who provides our basic needs. He is the one who provides our basic fulfillment. And it talks about our desires. A.J. Swoboda in his new book, The Gift of Thorns, write, little has more being, I'm sorry, little has more bearing on who we are or are becoming than how we relate to our desires. Indeed, what a person does with their desires invariably shapes who they are, where they're going and how they are and who they'll love. In other words, how we desire has as much consequence as what we desire. And nothing speaks to our most basic desire like the image of bread. Whether you're gluten-free or not, whether you're a Prager Brothers fan or whether you make your own sourdough, Bread for, for millennia has been the fundamental source of nutrition for the entire world. Jesus says, that is who I am. I am the bread of life. And he impacts his first saying in John chapter 6. Um, it's a lengthy chapter and one that we can't read the whole of it in the scope of this message. But I wanted to point out three different movements in this chapter of Jesus revealing that he's the bread of life. And he does this by three things. Number one, he asks us to reimagine the Passover. Secondly, by reimagining manna, the food that was given to them in the desert. And thirdly, reimagining Moses and the role that Moses played as ultimately pointing to him. Let's work through these three different movements that John does. The first one, is that in John 6, 4, it says this little verse that many of us would just skip over, but I I think it's the key really to this whole chapter. And it says this, the Jewish Passover festival was near, which means he is letting his audience know, think about the Passover. All of this took place in the context of this Jewish festival that he is providing us an idea of reimagining what we understand about it. This is a story, the famous story, the only miracle that's in all four Gospels of Jesus Jesus feeding the 5,000. John chapter 6, verse 12 says that after he had done this, when they were full, he told his disciples, collect the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. So they collected them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces from the five barley loaves and were left over by those who had eaten. When the people saw the signs he had done, they said, This truly is the prophet who is to come to the world. Therefore, when Jesus realized that they were about to come to take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. And so here's this incredible miracle. The feeding of 5,000 men, or another translation would be heads of household. And so this means that there are thousands of other people there as well. Other um, wives, children. And so there is this massive crowd. Jesus has, in essence, started the first megachurch. And as they're there, they realize that there's not enough food. And 
while they are, are debating on what to do, Jesus finds five barley loaves and two fish from this little boy and begins to thank his father for them, break them out, and he gives them out. And then here's what's really, really insightful, is after everyone has had their fill, there are 12 baskets left over, which is representation of the 12 tribes of Israel. And so it begins with us thinking about the Passover, this moment where Israel is at their lowest point, this moment where they're in desperate need of a deliverer, where they're eating in the middle of the night, wondering if they're going to be able to survive this exodus. And here Jesus says in the midst of them celebrating the Passover, he provides not only food enough for the crowd, but 12 baskets full of leftovers, which I think is is maybe the first point he's trying to make. When he says, I am the bread of life, he's moving them from an understanding in the theology of lack to a theology and understanding of God as the God of leftovers, that he has more than enough. And I love that he does this by a meal. I mean, you think about when the Israelites were fleeing from Egypt, he doesn't give them a song to sing or a liturgy to recite. He gives them a meal to eat. George Barna, the researcher, his organization one time did a sociological study on the phrases that produce the most joy. And they are in this order. Number one, I love you. Number two, I forgive you. And surprisingly, or maybe not, number three is dinner is ready. And those three phrases in that order are what produce joy inside us. And maybe this is exactly what God knew and was doing by pro- proving that he's the bread of life. He's saying, I love you, I forgive you, and dinner is ready. And so that's, I think, what Jesus is getting at first. Is the second is where, and at this point, everyone's happy. Who doesn't love a guy who can feed a crowd of somewhere between 10 to 20,000 people without a chef, without a catering line, and to have leftovers. And at this point, everyone's happy, but it says that they were literally trying to force him to make him king. But then it moves a bit further down into chapter six, and we we start having conversation around manna. And we see here that Jesus is trying to move them from thinking about just the, the perishable or the temporal into the eternal. So John chapter 6, we'll start in verse 25. It says, when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, truly, I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs, because you ate the loaves and were filled. Verse 27, don't work for the food that perishes, but for the food that lasts for eternal life which is the son of man who gives you because God the father has set his seal on approval on him. Skipping to verse 32, it says, Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, Moses didn't give you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said, sir, give us this bread always. And in verse 35, it says, I am the bread of life. Jesus told them that no one who comes to me will ever be hungry and no one who ever believes in me will ever be thirsty again. Verse 47 says that truly I tell you, anyone who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that anyone may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. The bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. And so what Jesus is doing right here is he's drawing their attention back, not just to Passover, but once they arrive in the wilderness. And he's saying that it wasn't Moses who gave you manna. It was my father. And my father is now giving you the true manna. And he says, that's me. I am the bread of life who comes and brings life to the world. And what I love about this passage is it moves from this thing that's very easy to get of like, oh, wow, there's more than enough with this God. At this point, he's starting to make a shift. He's saying, do not work for food that is perishable. And what he's saying is don't 
that you're, you're looking for bread that will just make you hungry again. I'm the bread that if you feast on me will be the thing that fully satisfies you. Now, when you look back to the Exodus story and the story of man, it's a pretty interesting one. In Exodus 15, the way that manna came about is in Exodus 15. They've just crossed the Red Sea. And it says that they erupt into song. One of the verses of the song says, The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. This is my God. And I will praise him, my father's God, and I will exalt him. One chapter later in Exodus 16, their song of gratitude turns into stanzas of complaining. In Exodus 16, verse 2, it says, The entire Israelite community grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in the land of Egypt when we sat by pots of meat and ate all the bread we wanted. Instead, you brought us into this wilderness to make this whole assembly die of hunger. Um, One chapter, literally verses apart, it goes from gratitude for deliverance to grumbling and really rewriting their history. We sat around pots of meat in Egypt. I mean, they were slaves. They had no days off. And I think that what I see is Jesus is reminding him of this story. Is that even when they had manna, that wasn't enough. They started grumbling for meat. And so God provided quail. But the reality is, is as long as you're searching for food, sustenance, fulfillment, that's perishable, you'll never be satisfied. And Jesus begins to speak directly to the desires of our heart. And what he's doing, which I find it so so remarkable and beautiful and profound, it is he's not saying you need to get rid of your desires. He's just saying you you need to recognize what actually produces the fulfillment you're longing for. St. Augustine once says that our life is a gymnasium of desires, right? We have cravings and appetites all the time. William Irvin, who's an Oxford philosopher, writes, desire animates the world. It is present in the baby crying for milk, the girl struggling to solve a math problem, the woman running to meet her lover and later deciding to have children, the old, the old woman hunched over her walker moving down the hall of the nursing home at a glacierly pace to pick up her mail. Banish desire from the world, and you get a world of frozen beings who have no reason to live and no reason to die. So our problem here, what Jesus is saying, is, is not the problem that we have desires or appetites or hunger. What he's saying is, what are you longing for to fill your desires, to satisfy your hunger, to bring fulfillment to your longings? And in the words of C.S. Lewis, He says, we are far too easily pleased. This is why I love verse 27 when Jesus says, don't work for the food that perishes, but for the food that lasts for eternal life. Or in Matthew's gospel, in the Sermon on the Mount, he he phrases it like this. Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves don't break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So I think the the question is, how do we redirect our appetites? Do we just pray them away and hope they don't exist? Do we become people who don't live with desires? There's a medical condition called aposia. Aposia is the dangerous condition of non-thirst, wherein someone experiences a near to total loss of sensation of thirst. And we're not, we're not, Jesus is not promoting um, a theological version of aposia. Like just stop wanting things, stop wanting the bread. What he's saying is that we need to direct them because the detachment of desires is far more Buddhist than Christian. Where where Buddhism would promote this this idea, and this is again a generalization, that desires are dangerous and should, should be detached from. Jesus does not diminish our desires. He just redirects them. He says, I need to be the fulfillment of that desire. This is why in verse 35, he says, I am the bread of life. 
Jesus told them, no one who comes to me will ever be hungry, and the one who believes in me will ever be thirsty again. Or if we go back to Matthew's gospel we just quoted in the Sermon on the Mount, he ends this section by saying, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these things, the bread that you want, the clothes that you want to wear will be provided for you. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So practically speaking, what what would that look like? How do we become aware of our desires? And are we able to understand are these for perishable things or eternal things? And how do we not make sure that our life is swallowed up by only perishable things that will make us hungry again? But how do we make sure our life is ultimately driven by eternal things? Let me just give you three practical things that you can do right now this week to begin to start becoming aware and redirecting your desires, drives, and appetites. Number one is building regular rhythms of fasting. A fasting is a phenomenal spiritual practice, ancient. It's been happening for millennia. Recently, uh, people have seen the physical benefits, the health benefits of it, and have used it for other things. But I would encourage you, if you haven't yet, fast. And if food is not an option for you, then you can do social media or digital fast. But the idea is choosing something you regularly feast on and remove it from your life for a time. Maybe that's uh, from sunup to sundown. Maybe it's uh, a more prolonged period of time. But when your craving comes in for real food, that is your bell, your reminder to ask yourself the question, what, what am I really craving? What are the deeper longings of my heart? Second practical thing I would encourage you to do besides fasting is restructure the start and the end of your day to be your healthiest eternal meals. Feast on the things that won't diminish. One of the things we um, institute with our kids is we say scripture before screens. Even when they're on spring break and we want them to sleep in and relax, uh, we want them to wake up building in habits and practices that make them desire things that are eternal. When you're closing out the day, um, doesn't mean they can't watch a, a good series or a family movie or a sports game. By the way, the Suns had an amazing game last night. Praise the Lord, he's moving. But uh, it's redirecting your thoughts to gratitude of looking back over your day and, and inviting Jesus to be the last thing you think on as you go to bed. And the third thing I would just encourage you with is build community with those who hunger for Jesus. Build community with those who have that shared appetite because this is what will change us. And so at this point, John opens up the story by saying, hey, Jesus provides leftovers. And we love this Jesus. We want to make, we want to force that Jesus to be king. But then Jesus moves it a, a notch lower in the passage where he says, okay, but your appetites can't be for bread. I'm the bread. He's moving our appetites. And at this point, people are like, okay. But the last movement of this is the most shocking of all. And this is where Jesus moves the conversation from our appetites to our allegiance. And he's saying, I, I'm a different kind of Moses. I'm a different kind of deliverer. I am pointing to something entirely different. I mean, to be honest, this section of John chapter six could also be titled how to obliterate your mega church. And at this moment, Jesus takes a crowd of, of arguably tens of thousands of people and diminishes it to 12. Let's read what happens. Verse 52 says, At that, the Jews argued amongst themselves, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life in yourselves. The one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Because my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink, and the one who eats my flesh and drink my blood remains in me and I in him. Just as the living father sent me and I live because of the father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. It will not, it is not like the man your ancestors ate and they died. The one who eats this bread will live forever. He said these things while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. Therefore, when many of his disciples heard this, they said, this teaching is hard. Who can accept it? 
Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples are grumbling about this, asked them, does this offend you? Then what if you were to observe the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? The Spirit is the one who gives life. The flesh doesn't help at all. The words that I've spoken to you are spirit and are life, but there are some among you don't, who don't believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning those who did not believe and the ones who would betray him. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless I'm granted to him by the Father. From that moment, many of his disciples turned back and no longer accompanied him. So Jesus said to the 12, you don't want to go away too, do you? Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom will we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Now, let's be honest. Every time I read the end of John chapter 6, I, I, I can't help but think, couldn't have Jesus said this in a different way? Couldn't have he have told them that he was pointing to the communion table? And this is kind of like a, a metaphoric kind of way to do that. Couldn't he have just left this part out? part out he just keeps reiterating this like eat my flesh drink my blood language that as as kind of a contemporary culture we read that and cringe but can i tell you something he's speaking to an ancient jewish religious audience they would have cringed more than you did hearing this and so there's there's three things that i want to observe here number one jesus seems less concerned about offending people than i naturally would I mean, right, he has 5,000 households sitting on this hillside. It's a movement. And he has no problem saying something that he very well knows will drive the crowd away. Second thing I observe is Jesus seems less impressed with the crowds than me. It doesn't seem to wow him. It doesn't seem to be the thing he's going for. His goal isn't the growth of the crowd. Which leads to the last observation is Jesus seems to be more focused in on his disciples than me. Now, these are strange words. And Matthew's gospel does a little bit better explaining what's happening here. Um, Matthew's gospel explains the feeding of the 5,000. And then the next chapter is the feeding of the 4,000, which I, again, I think is really funny in the church growth movement. It just Jesus knows how to shrink crowds in the church. But right in the middle of those two feedings, there's a, an exchange with a Canaanite woman who's asking for Jesus' time to heal her daughter. And there's an exchange of Jesus saying, I, I've come for Israel. And she makes this statement um, that she would just feed on the crumbs of this. And Jesus looks at this Canaanite, non-Jewish pagan woman, says, woman, your faith is great. Let it be done for you as you want. And from that moment, her daughter was healed. And, um, and the, the fact that this is in between the two feedings, Matthew's trying to, what is he, Matthew's trying to do is he's trying to shake up the Jewish worldview, the ancient religious Jewish worldview Jesus was confronting by saying, you're going to have to be offended if you're going to understand my kingdom. It's bigger and broader than you could ever imagine. And it is more inclusive than you would ever want. And this was a hard teaching. It seems that John's um, account of this is doing the same thing. He's trying to push the boundaries of what they thought was normal. But I think what's interesting is that John doesn't give us that explanation. John just lets us kind of sit with these strange words. Now, I did a lot of research and reading around what this means, and there's some beautiful, profound things. But the reality is, is John lets the reader sit with it. And he lets them sit with it because he immediately turns to his disciples and says, do you want to leave too? It, it seems to be one of the points. Is Jesus is specifically saying, it's me, and it's me to the point that you're going to feel uncomfortable. And Peter, who often gets in trouble for putting his foot in his mouth, actually says the right thing. He says, where else are we going to go? You have the words of life. And in a culture that continues, wants to celebrate the blessings and the gifts of leftover food, the blessings that Jesus brings, 
in a culture and in a world that we live in that even wants to say, okay, are we really desiring the right things? We really should be desiring Jesus. We also have to be the type of followers that would look at Jesus and say, this is a hard teaching, but I'm in. Jesus, you're, you're it for me. St. Augustine says that if you believe what you like in the gospel and reject what you don't like, it is not the gospel you believe but yourself. And Tyler Staten once says that Jesus did not reveal a God that we can perfectly understand, but he does reveal a God that we can perfectly trust. And my friends, that's, that's my prayer. When Jesus says, I am the bread of life, at, at first Hearing that, it's just like, yeah, who doesn't want bread? But then when Jesus says, yeah, but I want to be more important than all the other bread. And then when he says, and if you're going to have this type of bread, it means that you're going to have to be willing to be more uncomfortable than you realize. And by the end of this, we start realizing, oh, is this actually as easy as I once thought? And the answer is, it is as good. It is better than you thought. But understand that Jesus is the bread of life is a provocative statement. It's a challenging statement. He's challenging our appetites and desires. Are we just following Jesus for the perks and the benefits? Are we following Jesus regardless of how much it costs us, regardless of how much it makes us feel uncomfortable? Are we willing to say, Jesus, you're it for me. I'm yours and I cannot and I will not go anywhere else. So I want to leave us with the words that Peter says, Lord, to whom will we go? You have the words of eternal life. So my last encouragement to you as you're watching this or listening to this, would you find some time to take communion this week with your family or your roommates, a friend? Would you find some time to, to break bread, to open a bottle of wine or juice and Remember that the body that was broken was a real body. The blood that was shed was not a metaphor. It was real blood. That the cross of Christ was as real as the migraine that you feel or the pain you feel in your body. It was not a metaphor. And what Jesus is saying, I am the real bread of life. This is not some sort of therapeutic self-help talk. And it means that we have to take into consideration what we're all, what our other appetites are. And Jesus wants to be the center of it because he is the only one who we will never be hungry again, the water in which we'll never thirst again. And so my prayer is that this week, as you take communion together, as you fast this week, as you reorganize the start and the end of your day, as you look at the community around you, is that we would be a people who say, Jesus, you are what we long for and you are the ultimate thing that we desire. So let me pray for you. Father, we thank you that you don't just tell us what we want. You don't just tell us what's easy because if that were the case, then we'd have a hard time believing. I think about C.S. Lewis saying that a God fully comprehensible is no God at all. Lord, we confess that there are things we don't understand and things that are even hard for us to hear. But Jesus, I want to be a person and I want us to be a church that says, Jesus, no matter what, you have the words of life. Would we feast on you, Jesus? Would we drink deep of your presence? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the landscape of my life, you don't rush through any season. You always take your time. A careful hand gentle guide you take what's there away and you prune what's running wild so be the governor of my heart tear the soil of my soul you
you